All right, welcome back to Physics 1 students. So that was kind of interesting that we saw that when the magnet is free to turn around, it will align itself with the magnetic field nearby. And that's really what a compass needle does. It's just a tiny magnet that's free to pivot around on its axis. And when it aligns itself with Earth's magnetic field, its north pole points the way we call north. So its north pole is attracted to north. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? That, how could that be? The north pole should be attracted to south. Well. Let's go ahead and draw our picture and make sure we understand here, right? So the Earth acts like a giant bar of magnets. Its North Pole is over here. Its South Pole is over here, right? That's, that's kind of weird, but that's what happens, right? A, a compass needle's North Pole is attracted this way. And so I want you to go ahead and draw Earth's magnetic field based on the rules that we've established so far. Okay, so here's a professionally drawn picture. So it looks something like this, right? The magnetic field line should be coming out of this end, looping around, and then coming back in this way. And then remember, they do continue within the body of the magnet, in this case, the uh, within the Earth itself. Okay, so I know this seems weird, but let's just talk about what we're talking about the difference between the magnetic poles and geographic poles, right? So this is the south magnetic pole of the Earth. The north pole of the compass is attracted that way, but geographically, it's the North Pole over here at the, like the, the top of the globe, you know, where Santa lives. And over here at the bottom of the globe, we're looking up from the side where the penguins live, right? In the south, south pole, we call it geographic south pole. That's actually the North Pole of the Earth. So this is not going to change your entire world view, right? It's not like if you get driving directions that say to go north, point that way, and they say, nope, go the other way, you're, you're not going to end up in the right place, right? So we, we call it this way so that when we look at the compass needle, whichever way its north pole points, we follow it to go geographically north, even though we're going to magnetic south, right? So we follow the north pole of a compass to go north. That's the reasoning behind it. Okay. Now, what's interesting is that if you dig down deep into the Earth, you can pull up some naturally occurring magnetic materials, and they will also align themselves with Earth's magnetic field. Remember, out of this direction into this direction, then continuing within the body of the magnet itself, in this case, the Earth. But if you dig down deep enough, more than about 70,000 years ago, if the rocks formed, it shows that Earth's magnetic field used to be flipped. And about 70,000 years ago, it flipped to its current orientation. And if you dig down even deeper than that, you'll see that periodically, throughout Earth's history, its magnetic field lines have flipped over. The, the poles have flipped to their opposite orientation. And they're currently on the move. If you actually track Earth's geo, uh, excuse me, magnetic north and south poles, they actually change their location, which means that maybe they'll flip again. In fact, we predict they will. In fact, we, Earth seems to be rather overdue. And so if you're lost in the woods one day, and you're following your compass needle, and all of a sudden it flips the other way, you say, oh, well, it happened today. Nothing is going to change about your worldview, but just so you know, it could possibly happen. Okay, let's continue in our handwritten notes. We're looking at some applications of magnetism. Specifically, we'll look at an object called a velocity selector. And look, it starts with our good friends, the oppositely charged parallel plates. So I want you to go ahead and draw our oppositely charged parallel plates, positive on top, negative on the bottom. Draw the electric field. We're going to draw a positive point charge heading into the region between the plates. Go ahead and do that. Why do we keep going to oppositely charged parallel plates? Because, of course, the field is uniform. We know it's going to point to a positive and negative. We just went over those field line rules. We're going to label this with capital E, right? It's so all the usual stuff. Okay, now if we have the positive charge sailing on through here, we know what's going to happen. It's going to feel an electrostatic force to the bottom of the page, and it's going to follow this parabolic trajectory. It's sort of like a projectile. We've seen this idea before. It's not a uniform gravitational field, it's a uniform electric field. All right, so let's draw a little free body diagram of the positive charge. So here it is. It's going to feel electrostatic force to the bottom of the page because it's a positive charge. It follows field lines. That's the definition back from our summary of electric field line rules. But let's say we don't want it to do that. We want it to sail through here undeflected, which means if there's now an electrostatic force to the bottom of the page or down, if we're looking at it from the side, we need another force to the top of the page, and that's going to be a magnetic force. We want these two to balance out so there's no net force, so it sails on through. So now the question is, what direction would a magnetic field have to be so the magnetic force points this way to the top of the page? Remember, force and field are not the same thing. This is the direction of the force. What direction should the field be? So pause the video, see if you can figure it out. Okay, so for this one, we're sort of doing right-hand rule in reverse, and you should have gotten a field that points into the page. If you didn't do that, Pause the video, do the right hand rule, and see, justify for yourself why it's got to be into the page. So here's the idea. We already know which way it's moving, right? It's moving to the right, so our pointer finger points to the right. And we know the force has to point at the top of the page, so your thumb 
is the one that locks in there. Your pointer finger is pointing to the right, your thumb is pointing at the top of the page, and when you do that, what's the only way you can naturally curl your other fingers? That's going to be into the page. And again, you can do the right hand rule like normal. Pointer finger to the right, magnetic field lines or other fingers into the page, you should get your thumb pointing to the top of the page. And so it works, right? Okay, so here's the idea. We want this magnetic force to be equal. So we tune this magnetic field by introducing whatever magnet we need to so that these two forces are the same, so that they are equal to each other. Now we know that F sub E is equal to Q times Z, and F sub M, this is QVB sine theta. We're not using ILB sine theta. There's no wire with current here. There's a moving point charge, so it's QVB sine theta. What's theta in this case? Well, it's moving to the right. The field is into the page. What angle is that? That's 90 degrees, and sine 90 is 1. Okay, so we set these two equal to each other, and the sine theta goes away, right, because that's just equal to 1. So the QE equals QVB, and we're going to solve this for the charge going away. E equals VB. It's the same charge that goes away. So E equals VB. We're going to solve this for speed. The speed then is the ratio of E over B. So E, that's the field between the plates, and by tuning the potential difference across, you can tune up whatever electric field you want. B is the magnetic field, which you often have control of also by introducing whatever magnet you need. And so the idea is only charges that have this speed, the ratio of E over B, will go through undeflected. By doing this, by picking an electric field and picking a magnetic field, you are selecting only certain speeds. So the, re the reason why we do this is, let's say you have some sort of chemical reaction happening, and these ions are flying off with lots of energy. You want to, for some reason, isolate a certain speed so that you can do some experiments with it, and you already know the speed. This is what the velocity selector is used for. You select an electric field and a magnetic field so that whatever charges are going through here, only the ones with a speed equal to this ratio of E over B will go through undeflected so that these two forces cancel each other out for no net force. Now, just as a question, let's say you make it so that the electric field is, uh, excuse me, the electrostatic force is stronger. Which way will this charge be deflected? Well, you should be able to see it's going to be deflected down here, and so they will be collecting over here. What if instead we make the magnetic field stronger? Well, then they're going to be going this way, right? And so the point is that you want to pick out only this ratio of fields so that the only the ones with these speeds go sailing on through. Okay. Now what do we really do with this? We actually connect it to another device called a mass spectrometer. So take a moment and draw this. It's the same opposite charge parallel plate. So I want you to redraw it though, but probably a little smaller. And then it's connected to this very large device here. So to pause the video, draw this. Okay, so here's the idea. We have the electric field from the opposite charge parallel plates, and the magnetic field we've already established is into the paper. And then the magnetic field continues as a uniform magnetic field in this region. This is really the mass spectrometer here. And the walls of the mass spectrometer are made of some sort of detecting material. So if a charge comes through here and hits the wall anywhere, the wall is going to light up, sort of like the screen of the oscilloscope we saw in the video from last class. Now, what's really important is that this field in here is a, is a uniform magnetic field, and there's no more electric field. So here are these same charges. They're sailing on through at the speed that you've selected by tuning the electric field between the plates and the magnetic field from the, bar, from the magnet that you've put there. And so they come in here with a certain speed. But now the electrostatic force goes away. So if we do a quick right-hand rule or just review what we did before, which way will the magnetic force be pointing on these moving point charges? Okay, you should definitely get to the top of the page. You've already sort of done that. And so they're going to feel a magnetic force at the top of the page, which is unopposed. And so these charges are going to get deflected to the top of the page. Let's draw the charge sometime later. This force is at right angles, and so the speed doesn't change. It's moving at the same speed as before, but now it's moving up into the right, or to the top right corner of the page. So do a quick right-hand rule, and now figure out the direction of the magnetic force. Okay, so our fingers are pointing to the top right of the corner of the page. The field is still into the page. And when you stick your thumb out, remember it's really important that you make a, a total right angle between your pointer finger and your thumb. The magnetic force now is to the top left corner of the page, which means now it's going to be pulled sort of that way which means sometime later, here's the charge. Do another right-hand rule. Figure out which direction the magnetic force is on this charge. It should be getting to the left. Right? The charge is moving directly away from you to the top of the page. The field is into the page. And so when you stick your thumb out, making an L between your thumb and pointer finger, that force is pointing to the left. So now it's going to be pulled back. And if we continue plotting its course, it's going to come back and hit the detector screen. The detector screen is going to light up here. And we'll be able to see where it hits. Notice what shape is it tracing out? Let me remind you, the force here is always at right angles to the motion, always pointing towards the center. Yes, this is a circular path. What's the name for that force pointing to the center of a circular path, always pointing at right angles to the velocity, never changing the speed, only changing the direction? Oh, that's centripetal force. And so 
The magnetic force is causing a centripetal force tracing out a circle, a diameter given by this, which we can measure r, the radius of that circle. Okay. So here, we see the magnetic force is causing the centripetal force. It is the net force acting on it. Now, what's the equation for centripetal force? Ooh, remind yourself, that is going to be mv squared over r, right? And of course, it's moving point charge, so it's qvb sine theta equals mv squared over r. What's the angle theta here? Well, all these velocities are in the plane of the page, and the magnetic field is into the page. That's always going to be 90 degrees, as it happens a lot. I mean, of sine 90, of course, it's 1. All right, and so what I want us to do is I want us to solve this. Sine theta goes away. I want you to solve this ratio of q over m. So just pause the video, do a little bit of algebra, solve for q over m. You should definitely see one factor of speed goes away. Put the m down there, put the b down there. So we should be getting q over m equals v over rb. Obviously, you know, if you got br, it's the exact same thing. But definitely by doing some good algebra, it should be q over m equals v over rb. We're going to go ahead and box that in. It's sort of a, maybe it's more like a quasi new equation, but it's pretty important, right? We're going to see this enough, this idea of the mass spectrometer. Now, it's, be careful, it's only for a uniform magnetic field. If this field over here were varying, it wouldn't trace out a circle anymore because it wouldn't have a constant force always pointing towards the center, always at right angles to the velocity. Well, a constant force, I should say. Okay, so how do we use this? Well, I already said, by using the velocity selector, we already know what speed these charges are going to have. And by doing the velocity selector, we already chose a magnetic field. So we know V, we know B. Right? And by seeing the diameter of the circle, and then taking half of that, we can measure R. Because remember, these charges light up. They hit the screen, they light up. Right? So we know R. So we know V, we know R, we know B. And very often, when these chemical reactions happen, we already know the, the charge on these ions. So we know Q, V, R, and B. What's left? M. Remember, this is a mass spectrometer. This is actually a way to measure the mass of these tiny, tiny objects. Back when we first introduced the masses of the proton and electron, things like that, 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, you said to yourself, how on earth can we measure the mass of such a thing? You can't just pile a bunch of them on a scale and then tally them up. It's, it's, it's too tiny, right? This is it. This is how you measure the mass of ridiculously tiny objects. Send these charged objects into a uniform magnetic field. It's going to trace out a circle, measure the radius of that circle, and by knowing all the other things, you can calculate the mass. This is it. This is how it's done. Now, why is it a mass spectrometer? Well, very often, when you have these chemical reactions, a bunch of these ions fly out, but they're all of slightly different mass. They'll have the same charge, but the masses will be different. And part of the knowledge of the chemical reaction is knowing the ratio of those masses. And so if everything else is the same, they come out with the same speed, we already selected that. They all have the same charge, and B is the same. Every different mass will have a different radius, which means they're all going to hit here at different radii of the circle, forming a spectrum of hits on the detector screen. It is a mass spectrometer. That's the way it works.